Well, you will find it helpful to uh, have that passage of the Bible in front of you. Do look that up in your Bibles or your, your phones or whatever. A uh, passage in Matthew 10. But as we start, I want to read from you uh, a book that I was looking at this week. And the author writes, bringing the gospel, bringing the, the message of Jesus, his sacrifice, bringing the gospel, bring the gospel to an ethnic community in the West and see young people respond to the claims of Christ. And it will not be long before hatred surfaces, even within the family. In one community, whose pastor I know, writes this author, a young woman was beaten up by her brother every Sunday for six months when she came back from church. In another family, when the father and brothers could not stop a young man from following Christ, they told him they would beat up his mother every time he went to a Christian meeting. And they did, so he could not attend any longer. This wasn't written in the first century. It wasn't written in a distant country. It's describing Western Europe, uh, and the book was written just a few years ago. And uh, We talked about suffering earlier, and this is the reality, that actually followers of Jesus, even today, face big hostility. And yet I'd be surprised looking out here if that was the experience of many of you. I imagine lots of you have faced apathy, maybe a pointed remark, an unpleasant joke, some critical comment. Some of us might have faced things more serious, but I would imagine for many of us as Christians, we don't feel these levels of persecution that we see in the passage. And it raises this question in the Christian life, doesn't it? What do we expect? With the people around us, the people we know, and the people around us in Biddenden, we're living as those on a mission. A church together on a mission. And we want to share, don't we, Jesus with those around us. And what is that going to feel like? What is it going to be like? Are we going to expect to be flogged and beaten up for being Christian? We're going to have a look at this, this passage in Matthew to help us set our expectations. If you remember, Jesus was was speaking to his 12 apostles. He's got this unique mission team, the, the foundation of the new Israel. And so we saw last week, if you're here, some of what he says in this section is unique to those first 12. But as we go through it, it kind of expands and, and more and more of it becomes broader. as something for all those who'd say they're Christians. And this mission of the 12 is like a kind of, a little sort of model that points to the realities for what we're all about, for what we're all involved in. This kind of little picture of what it is for all of us. And so if you're listening today and, and you wouldn't say you're a Christian, this is actually, for, for all it's hard, it's a really helpful sermon because this is the reality of what Jesus is inviting you to be part of. So we're going to look through this passage and we're going to see what it means and what it means for our expectations. And we've got four things that we're going to see about mission. Okay, four things that we're going to see about sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus. So firstly, we're going to see how to be in mission. How to be in mission. So look down with me at verse 16. And Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And you read that and you think, well, that's a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? I thought that Jesus was the good shepherd. What kind of shepherd just plunks his sheep in the, the middle of a load of wolves? But this is the reality of the Christian life, that Jesus is the good shepherd. And Jesus cares for his sheep, that he never deals with recklessly with us he never kind of treats us like mindless cannon fodder but yet he does ask his sheep to do difficult 
and uncomfortable things. That on Jesus' mission, there is no promise that the Christian life is going to be easy. And there are those around, aren't there, that would seek harm to the church. Now, next week, we're going to see a bit more to it. We're going to see that actually, although there are these wolves, they are on a tight lead. That, that God is in control of the life and death of his flock. That, that God cares for his children so much and, and keeps them and takes them to himself at just the right time. But this mission will at times feel scary. And how should we be? We should be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as dogs. So as we seek to, to tell people about the Lord Jesus, we should be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as dogs. And we've got to see those two go together. Right, so if we were here and simply saying, well, you should be as shrewd as snakes, we'd become sort of like kind of gospel-used car salesmen. Uh, apologies if you're a used car salesman. But we'd, we'd sort of use every trick in the book to, to make sure people came to our events or, or to make them come here as opposed to any other church. Or if we were simply as innocent as doves, we'd... Just be a bit naive about how the world is. And we'd open ourselves up to being manipulated or used or just silenced by the, the pressure of the world. And he says, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And what does he mean? Well, to be shrewd as snakes, he, he's saying we should have a wise understanding of the situation of the world around us. That we should respond with, with intelligence. We should think about what we're doing. Not, not kind of super intelligent, thank goodness. But just as we're sharing about the Lord Jesus, we're thinking about what we're doing. We're thinking carefully about how we communicate his message. We're not kind of naive about how hard it is for people to hear that they are, are sinners. That they are rebels against God. We're not naive about the state of the battle in people's hearts as truth and lies go into battle. And we're shrewd that we, we seek to, to share Jesus in ways that connect with people. That we're going about wisely the realities of mission in our culture. We're, we're not kind of naive that people will, will just kind of normally just wander in regardless of what it's like, regardless of what efforts we do and don't make. To be as shrewd as snakes, I mean, we were aware of the complexities of culture and people's lives when we share Jesus. So in our kind of context, it means we think wisely about having good publicity or our carol service. We're going to make it welcoming. We're going to have a, a kind of nice decorations and refreshments and we're going to think really carefully about what language we use and, and what songs we have that are familiar to people. Now, those things are not the gospel, are they? They, they don't affect the content of what we're going to say, but, but being as shrewd as snakes in our kind of situation just means, well, that the things that we think about will make a big difference to how people hear that good news of Jesus. And being as shrewd as snakes means we're aware of the opposition. That people may lie and cheat and suppress the truth. And we are ready for any sort of tactics that people bring. And just remember at this point, remember what we saw last week. People are not opposed to us. They're opposed to the king. Being shrewd as snakes means we think about what we're doing. And being innocent as doves, that means that everything we do in mission, everything we do in, in sharing the good news should be totally pure and above board. And let me read to you from 2 Corinthians 4. And Paul writes, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So we're as innocent as doves in the sense that, that everything we do should be open for everyone to see. That, that we don't bring people in to, 
to an event on the false presenters and then, oh, surprise, there's a talk. Well, we don't resort to lying. We don't resort to anger when other people lie and they're angry with us. We don't kind of cut bits out of the message that we're saying because we think that will make it more palatable. That is one of the reasons why we, we were talking about this. We, we have our finances on display to anyone who wants to see. We've got nothing to hide. We've got nothing we're going to take out. We've not got anything we're going to sneak in under the carpet. No one should have any accusation against us. Apart from we preach a gospel that people don't want to hear and a kingdom that people don't want to be part of. That we, this is how we're to be in mission. That we are as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Well, let's look at what we'll do in mission. Look with me at verse 18. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils. That, that, by the way, that's the religious council. It's not the kind of Ashford County Council. <laughs> I just thought that as Stephen was saying it. You'll be brought before the county council. No, you'll be brought before the religious councils and flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Now, we're not going to spend ages on this bit because... It's not a huge part of our experience in 21st century Britain. But a time may come when it will be. Or, or for some of us it might be. And what's Jesus saying we'll do? We will bear witness. We will talk about Jesus. In an, a whole number of different places. And some of them might be hostile. And some of us may end up being arrested for speaking of Jesus but around the world, our brothers and sisters certainly will be. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a lady, uh, maybe a little older than me, and she used to live in a country where it was illegal to be a Christian. Uh, and her, she had her uncle used to print these Bibles, and they'd made their own printing press, uh, and they would publish these Bibles in secret. And she was telling me that when she was a little girl, the, the secret police came around and knocked on her door. And they came to raid her parents' house and look for these Bibles. Now, in God's kindness, they'd all been moved out. I think she said it was like the day before. And the secret police came around to look for these Bibles. And some of her relatives were put in prison. And they never found this printing press, but they knew they were doing it. They hadn't been caught plotting a coup. They hadn't been rioting. They'd simply been trying to get Bibles into people's hands. And Jesus writes, be on your guard. That in mission, we might find ourselves in trouble. We, it might not be fair, it might not be just. But if we seek to share Jesus, this is what we would expect. And that seems scary as we read it. And I can imagine it was pretty terrifying. And did you see the promise in verses 19 to 20? When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. That we're not left alone in mission. It's not just up to us. When things get tough, God is right there with us. His spirit is speaking through us. If you are ever arrested for being a Christian... And let's be honest, we don't know what sort of world our young people will live in. Then here is a direct promise of the Holy Spirit at work. Well, and I think by extension, these verses help us in just that kind of everyday opportunities for, for sharing Jesus. You know, often when we're talking to people, we think, what will I say? How do I answer these questions? No, I know that's not the same as a kind of trial before governors, but... The encouragement that the Spirit's role within us is to make the Lord Jesus known. That when, when mission seems most daunting there, the Spirit is with us. I just want encouragement in the everyday Christian life. That the Holy Spirit is with us every step of the way. Through the trials and the sorrows and the joys, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus is with us. 
This then is what we'll do in mission. Well, let's look at the most challenging part. What we'll face in mission. And just read with me again in verses 21 to 23. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is a fairly stark picture, isn't it? A world where loyalty to Jesus means serious hostility. Hostility from family, and indeed, he says, hostility from everyone. And he means all sorts of different people will be opposed to King Jesus. That's what it says, isn't it? We will be hated because of me, because of Jesus. People don't hate us because we're kind of personally annoying or they don't like the way that Christians do their hair or they wear funny clothes. They hate people because of Jesus. They don't hate us necessarily because we're out delivering stuff through their door or because we're their colleague who always kind of wants to talk about deeper things. They hate us. Because of Jesus. Think about that that quote that we read earlier, right at the beginning, about the kind of hostility to Jesus in, in particular communities. Why? Because the claims of Jesus are absolute, aren't they? This is everything. This is absolute priority. And when that faces another claim of absolute authority, such as Islam... When there is a conflict, that's where we see these terrible things. Where is it the most dangerous place to be a Christian at the moment? You can look it up. So according to the the, the Open Doors, they published the World Watch List. And the top three places for persecution, uh, I was going to do this in a kind of countdown, but that just seemed really inappropriate. So the most dangerous place to be a Christian is in North Korea. And if you're caught being a Christian, there is the, the risk of swift execution or life imprisonment in a labor camp. Or you could be a a Christian in Afghanistan where believers from a Muslim background must live in secret or flee. Or the third most dangerous place is Somalia. Anyone suspected of converting from Islam is going to be harassed or intimidated or or even killed by their, their clan or possibly their immediate family, just like he says here. And what do you notice about these places? They're all places where Jesus' kingdom comes in direct authority with the claims of another absolute authority, either the claims of Islam or the claims of the the, the Kim family in North Korea. You will be hated by everyone because of me. And that's really helpful for us as we consider the experience of being a Christian in this country. Because... I would imagine not many of us fear death for the gospel on a daily basis. Why? Well, one thing could be, and I've I've been wrestling with this as I've looked at the passage this week, it could be because we're just not bold enough. It could be because we're just not active enough in speaking about Jesus. And we do have to be honest with ourselves, don't we? If, If we don't experience this rejection about speaking for Jesus... Is it because we're not doing it? And I think I probably speak for lots of us. I think I'm not that different to many of you. I quite like a quiet life. I don't really like being hated. I'd I'd really rather not. And I've got to say, has my love of comfort, does it mean I don't speak for Jesus when I should? And this is a genuine question for all of us from this passage, isn't it? When was the last time that we risked discomfort and rejection by bringing Jesus into the conversation. But there are also, and this is part of our, our wisdom, isn't it? There are also cultural factors that mean we're less likely to experience this level of hostility. Because we live, we live don't we, in a, a time when our society is really against a kind of one single authority claim. 
It, it's very different from North Korea or, or a world with an Islamic government. We don't have this kind of one single authority claim. Actually, our society is very happy to, to see people follow all sorts of things. And, and, and Jesus is one voice of, among many, rather than this kind of one-on-one -on -one that, that we see in other places. Now, in time, that may well change. In, in time, it may become even harder to be a Christian. But for the moment, let us make the most of this opportunity. As we look around and think we are allowed to meet, we don't have to meet in secret. We can have a, a public carol service and we say, come along and hear about the Lord Jesus. Let's make the most of this chance. Now, that doesn't deny that at times we do face hostility. And I'm sure many of you have. I'm sure you've been looked down on by your families. I'm sure that people at times think you're a weirdo. They may not seek to kill you, but they might not want to hang out with you. But we know that our brothers and sisters around the world face this kind of persecution because they identify with the Lord Jesus. And what a call for us to remember them, that we are part of Jesus' body, that we're part of his people, that they are our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted and killed for Jesus' sake. What a call to specific prayer for the persecuted church. And that would be a great outcome from this sermon, to commit to praying for our brothers and sisters around the world whose lives are far tougher than ours. And you can get updates from Open Doors or Barnabas Fund or, or whoever to pray specifically for our brothers and sisters who face this real violent persecution. I hope this is something that we'll do as a church in, in our services and our prayer meetings because as God's people, we're in this together. And how do we respond? Well, look with me at verse 22. It's really right at the centre of this passage. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is the centre of what I want us to take away this morning. Being a Christian at times will be really hard. And being a Christian at times will mean hatred and persecution. Do not give up. Do not give up. Being a Christian at times will bring sorrow and weakness. Do not give up. Do not give up your faith in the Lord Jesus. Do not give up trusting in the faithfulness of God. Do not give up meeting with God's people when that's hard, when that's inconvenient, when your family would rather you didn't. Do not give up speaking about the Lord Jesus, even when it hurts, and it will. When being a Christian is hard, do not give up. Why? Because the Son of Man is coming. The Lord Jesus is coming back and he's coming in judgment. And our friends and our neighbours and our families need to hear before the Son of Man comes. Do not give up because we are in this together as the people of the Son of Man. Because mission means a life like Jesus. Mission means a life like Jesus. I want to read to you another section from our book I looked at this week. And the author writes this. The extreme into which most people are liable to fall in the present day is that of silence, cowardice, letting others alone. Our so-called prudence is apt to degenerate into a compromising line of conduct. We're only too ready to suppose it's no good trying to do good to certain people. We excuse ourselves from efforts by saying it, it, it would be indiscreet. It would give needless offence. It might even do harm. It sounds really contemporary, doesn't it? It was actually written in 1856. Uh, it was written, I think we've got a picture. A oh, great beard. Uh, you think, what's the point that we see with that? See, our temptations don't change very much, do they? Uh, are we tempted to think we're being careful? See, are we just being comfortable? 
And now, don't get me wrong, I'm speaking to myself as much as any of you. I don't want people to think I'm weird. There's times when I don't speak. I better done next time. But mission means a life like Jesus. And that means faithfulness to the truth because we love people like Jesus, don't we? Uh, we, we don't do this because we're ticking a box. We love our friends and our family and our neighbours. And we want them to hear about Jesus. So look with me at verses 24 to 25. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, so basically if, if people are saying Jesus is demonic, how much more the members of his household? Again, what's the point he's making? We've seen it all along. As we live our Christian life, we should expect the same things as Jesus. And we talk loads, don't we? We want to follow Jesus. We long to be like Jesus. And therefore we expect the experiences like Jesus. If the master is rejected, so we the servants will be. We're not expecting a comfortable life because that's not what Jesus got. It is enough for us to be identified with Jesus. We don't expect an easy ride. And I know we've sat here and I've stood here and this is heavy. And Jesus is calling us to follow him and walk the path he walked. And if Jesus' good news was ascribed to Satan, how much more will we look like troublemakers? Uh, there's, a, there's a book about it, I forget the title, but the, basically the point is we're going to have to get used to being the baddies, to being seen as being disruptive and evil and bad for people. Even though we seek to do nothing but good and to see people come to eternal life, Jesus was accused of being evil and so were we. But what is the good news is the hope that comes from identifying, from following, from being united with Jesus. Because Jesus was persecuted to the point of death. That was not the end. That was not the end, was it? It's tempting to think after a passage like this that we, we're just called to be kind of tragic anti-heroes. Who's, who, it's all about being rejected and that's it. But that is not the end of the story. That is not the end of the story. That The news of the kingdom grew and spread and it was received and it was welcomed. And there was good soil that, that bore fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. How many people are in this passage going out? 12. There are more than 12 people in this one room, in one church, in one country. Some people will receive the message and rejoice. And in his suffering and in his death was Jesus' vindication and his glory. That he was declared glorious with all the power of God. That we don't follow the one who died as a failure, but the one who was raised and exalted at the right hand of the Father. Yeah, people might think we're baddies. People might hate us and reject us. But when the Son of Man comes, we will be vindicated because we will be raised with him to glorious new life. We need not fear a life of hardship. We need not fear death. We don't need to despair in the face of death. We grieve, but we face persecution and even death with hope because life like Jesus means resurrection like Jesus. We remember those whose sacrifice meant a life of freedom this morning. And it's right that we do that. But we remember him whose sacrifice meant an eternity of blessing and joy in his resurrection. That's why we don't give up, even though this is hard, because the message of the kingdom is good news. We've got something wonderful to tell people, a hope that lasts beyond the grave. A king and a shepherd with power to save people from their sins. 
And in God's kindness, some will hear and respond and be saved.